Pennsylvania. Listen, please, let's all welcome Scott Mingus. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the warm welcome tonight. I bring you greetings from Springfield, Ohio, where I'm sitting at a Red Roof Inn on my way to uh, Chicago tomorrow to speak live to the Lincoln Davis Civil War Roundtable on my book, Targeted Tracks, about the Cumberland Valley Railroad and the Civil War. Tonight, we want to talk about one of our favorite topics, Jeb Stewart. Now, this is the impression I think most of us have. There's a certain movie that I think a lot of people have seen over the years. Uh, this is a scene from obviously Ron Maxwell's movie on Gettysburg. And this is the impression that most Americans have of Jeb Stewart during the Gettysburg campaign. General Stewart, where have you been? I've not heard a word for you for days and you are the eyes and ears of my army. So where's Stuart? I mean, the popular belief is that Lee is chastising Stuart. That's the impression we get from the movie. Although the actual conversation really hasn't been recorded other than one or two uh, later claims about what may have been said there. What was Jeb Stuart really doing on June 30th, July 1st, July 2nd, 1863? Now you read some of the popular literature, you'll hear people talk about He's gallivanting, he's joyriding around the Union Army again, he's glory hunting, he's looking for headlines. Well, that may be partially true, but those of us who live in York County, Pennsylvania know exactly the, uh, the difficulties that Jeb was facing over that three day period. And hopefully over the next 45 minutes to, or so, as I share, a little bit about Stewart's ride through York County, uh, that would give you a much better impression of what Jeb Stewart was actually doing. Let's step back to the basics. Stewart has with him three of the seven brigades of Robert E. Lee's cavalry available to the Army in Northern Virginia. Lee himself has kept four brigades behind. Stewart has under his direct command for the purpose of this talk tonight and the purpose of his side expedition, three brigades, uh, Fitzhugh Lee's brigade, uh, which of course is the first through the fifth Virginia, a very veteran, very good uh, group of regiments. He's got John Chambliss Jr., a son of United States Congressman before the war. Chambliss is new to brigade command. He has taken over for Rooney Lee, Robert E. Lee's son, who was wounded at Brandy Station. The third brigade uh, is Wade Hampton's brigade. Hampton, of course, most of us know, uh, one of the wealthiest men in the South, uh, you know, pretty good cavalier, uh, certainly quite talented in his command and personal bravery. Uh, Stewart's also got some horse artillery as usual with him. He's 30 years old at the time of the Gettysburg campaign. He's got approximately 4,500 men. Uh, now that numbers widely varies depending on what books you read. Uh, there really isn't a great accounting of exactly how many men Stuart had, but 4,500 is probably in the ballpark. So let's step back. On June 22nd, Robert E. Lee has told Stuart to guard the mountain passes, uh, Bull Run Mountains, and then cross the Potomac and screen Yule's right flank. Now that's, Stuart had come to him wanting to have some sort of independent mission. So on the 25th of June, uh, Stewart and his three brigades depart from, from Salem, Virginia. Everything's going fine. Keep in mind the second part of Lee's instructions to cross the Potomac and screen Yule's right flank. Now, Stewart expects to find Yule somewhere along the Susquehanna River, York County, uh, Cumberland County, somewhere along the Susquehanna River south of Harrisburg. So that's always in his mind on June 25th when he leaves uh, from Salem, that he's going to find the infantry and artillery of the Army of Northern Virginia along the Susquehanna River. That's going to guide his directions throughout the rest of the, uh, uh, the day, rest of the trip. Well, Stewart takes off and all, everything's going fine until he gets to Thoroughfare Gap. Uh, and he finds Thoroughfare Gap solidly in the hands of the Yankees. Um, Winfield Hancock's second corps is there. Um, they're not supposed to be there in Stewart's mind, uh, but they are. Uh, Stewart's going to end up lobbing a few shells at him, uh, going to have a brief engagement at Thoroughfare Gap, and we'll learn that he cannot force his way through the second corps. 
then he starts making a series of decisions is going to directly impact what will eventually become the Battle of Gettysburg. His first decision is, where do I go? I can't go the planned route. Now he could have turned north and tried to find a different route to Pennsylvania, but instead he chooses to go south and east and then move towards Washington, uh, hoping to get around the rear of the Union Second Corps. Uh, and he ends up moving to Rockville, Maryland. Uh, and as we probably know, Stuart ends up capturing a very large number of Union supply wagons. He ends up keeping 125 of the wagons and he's got 400 Union prisoners. Uh, the Teamsters, Cavalry Escort, uh, various other Federals that he picks up along the way. He starts heading north, heading towards Pennsylvania, again, still with a goal of finding Richard Yule along the Susquehanna River. Everything starts falling apart on June 29th. Uh, he's going to end up encountering the first Delaware and other uh, Union troops at Westminster, Maryland. Uh, he's going to be delayed significantly. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Captain, uh, I think his name is Charles Corbett, leads an attack on Stuart's uh, vanguard, uh, stops him in his tracks. Stuart has to bring up his, his men, deploy into battle formation, and they're going to fight a pitched battle at Union Mills. Stuart's going to stop for the night, not terribly far, uh, or fight at Westminster. He's going to stop at Union Mills for the evening. On June 30th, he still thinks he's got a, a good fighting shot at getting to the right flank of Richard Yule, which happens in this case to be Jubal Early's division. Early had moved east uh, along what's today US Route 30 from the Chambersburg region. He's crossed South Mountain. He's went through Gettysburg, has taken Gettysburg on June 26th. Uh, that's the subject of the book. That's the door prize tonight, Flames Beyond Gettysburg, that uh, we're going to pass out. But Early has marched into York, and in fact, he's well, on June 28th, uh, one of his brigades, that of John Gordon, has went all the way to Wrightsville, uh, some uh, 60 or so, 65 miles east of Chambersburg. So that's the goal for Stuart, is to find Joe Borley. Uh, but as he enters Pennsylvania on June 30th, uh, he's got two towns in mind. He splits his force. Uh, some of them are riding towards Littlestown, the rest of it are riding towards Hanover. That's where our story begins tonight with that backdrop. So here's the tactical situation on Tuesday, June 30th, 1863. As we all know, John Buford is now sitting in Gettysburg with uh, two of his three brigades. Uh, Johnston Predigrew is marching east as part of the Confederate advance across South Mountain. Uh, they are not going to have a battle on June 30th, but certainly Pettigrew and Buford are gonna spot one another's troops. Uh, at the same point in time, Jube Worley has received orders on June 29th, as has uh, Richard Yule up at uh, uh, Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, to concentrate the army at Cashtown or Heidlersburg. So early, very early on the morning of June 30th, in fact, at 6 a.m. at the latest, uh, all the Confederates have now left York. And at the same time, Yule has left Mechanicsburg and is heading to Carlisle. Stewart doesn't know of the concentration orders, of course. Uh, in his mind, Jubal Early is still sitting somewhere around York. Now keep in mind that if you look on the map, York uh, is in the center of the map with a Confederate flag there. You see Carlisle in the upper left where Yule's going. The road that joins them is today's Pennsylvania Route 74. Uh, that runs through Wigelstown, Dover, Wellsville, and Dillsburg. Let me pay attention particularly to Dillsburg because Dillsburg is a concentration point before Heidlersburg and uh, Cashtown are ordered. It's Dillsburg. That's where uh, Early's told that he's supposed to march to eventually. That's where Stuart thinks he's going to go as a fallback position. A.P. Hill has been ordered to take his entire corps to Dillsburg, uh, but that order was countermanded, of course, before he can actually even begin the march to Dillsburg. But Stuart's got Dillsburg in the back of his mind. That's going to become important as we go through the evening. But what he doesn't count on is Judson. Kilpatrick. Kilpatrick's division of Union Cavalry is sitting square in Stewart's path uh, at Hanover, Pennsylvania. 
Stewart doesn't know this, of course. He's got no clue that the Yankees, are, especially Yankees from the Army of the Potomac, are anywhere close to him. He's going to fight the battle uh, on June 30th in Hanover. Uh, some of you may not be aware that Jeb Stewart almost is taken prisoner uh, by the 1st West Virginia Cavalry and other Union soldiers during the Battle of Hanover. Uh, this illustration by Reuben Becker that hangs in the library of Hanover, probably most of you have probably never seen it before, but it shows Jeb Stewart uh, uh, on his horse uh, leaping a 15 foot wide ditch with W.W. Blackford, uh, the other Confederate officer behind him. If Stewart's horse uh, and Blackford's horse, uh, horses, uh, Virginia and Beauty, uh, don't cross that, Stewart and Blackford are probably taken prisoner. However, they're not, and they escape. But the close call has the, has the start of, again, a very bad day for Stewart on June 30th. Um, he can't fight his way through Hanover. There's no way he can get to Job early through that route. There's way too many Union cavalrymen sitting on, on his path. And he decides in the middle of the Battle of Hanover to start withdrawing. Uh, Stewart, according to his official report, writes, I thought by making a detour to the right by Jefferson, I could save the wagon train. The wagon train is so important in Stewart's mind. He needs to deliver the wagon train to, to Robert E. Lee. I therefore determined to try it, particularly as I was satisfied from every accessible source of information, as well as from the lapse of time that the Army in Northern Virginia must be near the Susquehanna. Now, Stewart has been picking up northern newspapers in Maryland, and he's got a pretty good idea, although typically a day or two late, as to where Jubal Early is. Uh, he has read that Jubal Early is in York, uh, so he knows that's where he needs to go. Uh, and that will, of course, be his first and immediate goal as he pulls out of Hanover and tries to extricate himself from a battle that he hadn't planned on fighting. Uh, he needs to pull away. So he's going to leave is wounded in Hanover, as many as, as uh, he can carry with him, he'll take, uh, but he leads them to the Yankees care into the doctors of Hanover and starts pulling away from the battlefield. Now he can't just simply pull all three brigades out. He's going to have to do it in stages. And the first stage is to get Fitzhugh Lee off the battlefield with a wagon train. Uh, and that's exactly what's going to happen. Uh, so Fitzhugh Lee will pull out of the Battle of Hanover in mid-afternoon. Uh, some accounts suggest about 2.30 or so uh, that Fitzhugh Lee will depart with the wagon train behind him. Now, one thing Stewart does, is because he really doesn't know this territory at all, is he, at gunpoint, his men force three men from southwestern York County to be forced guides. Uh, we know the names of two of them, uh, Ephraim Nace and Jeff, Jacob Lepo. Uh, we don't know who the third man was, but Stewart is going to force these three men to lead each of his brigades uh, forward so they know where they're going. Shambliss is gonna pull out at dusk uh, and he's gonna leave Wade Hampton behind to face George Armstrong Custer and uh, Kilpatrick and there'll be an artillery duel uh, well into the dark at the Battle of Hanover. Uh, Hampton's finally gonna pull out uh, well after dark. So the June 30th Battle of Hanover comes to a close, but for Jeb Stewart and for Fitzhugh Lee, uh, the ride's only beginning. Uh, now the men are tired, they've been fighting uh, on and off uh, for uh, quite a while. They've ridden up and over the hills of Maryland uh, since the morning. Uh, and Stewart pauses uh, Fitzhugh Lee's brigade and more importantly, tries to rest the wagon train near Jefferson, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is some 12 miles or so uh, from Hanover. It's a very small crossroads village. Here at Hanover, Stewart's men are going to raid the town's uh, supply of stores. Uh, if you notice back here on the, on the public square, there are three stores in town and Stewart's men are gonna hit them all. Uh, so this uh, talks about 7,500 uh, Confederate and Union soldiers over a four day period will pass through Jefferson. Again, 4,500 of them being stored on June 30th. Uh, the rest break is going to last approximately about an hour. Uh, we know from a, uh, the York County damage claims that were filed after the Civil War are an absolutely wonderful treasure trove 
of information on exactly where Stuart was and what his men were doing and at what time. 853 civilians from York County, Pennsylvania, filed damage claims after the Civil War with the three-man state commission, hoping to get their money back for what the Confederates or the Union took from them. Uh, if the Yankees took it, you filed a claim with the United States government. If the Confederates took your items, you filed a claim with this three-man commission uh, from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. By the way, none of the 853 people ever got a dime from the Commonwealth. Uh, budget cuts and uh, political infighting between the Democrats and Republicans killed it every time it came up for the budget, and nobody ever got a dime. But as a writer, all these sworn testimonies are a gold mine because the merchants and the civilians had to list who took things. Uh, so we know, you know, they'll list Stewart's Cavalry, they'll list uh, Fitzhugh Lee, for example, or Jubal Early if the infantry took things. But we have a complete list of everything they took. This is William T. Chris list from his stores. And again, you can see the military ecstasy of what Stewart's men are taking. It's shoes. Uh, among everything else. The other thing they take a lot of, a lot of throughout your county is cloth. Uh, and it took me a long time to figure out why they'd be that interested in cloth until uh, Eric Wittenberg and a couple of the other guys that I'm friends with that are experts in cavalry told me very simply, they wanted to reinforce the britches of their pants uh, because their pants would often wear through trousers uh, from all the saddles uh, in the long, long hours spent on that. So they would actually reinforce the seats of their of their uniform pants with uh, calicos, muslin, wool, whatever they can grab. So again, you can see what Stewart's men are taking. Uh, interestingly enough, they're going to take 200 hand rolled York County cigars uh, with the tobacco supply in Virginia and North Carolina cut off. South Central Pennsylvania has become a significant source of tobacco. Uh, since the start of the Civil War and will continue as a major tobacco uh, uh, growing region, even to this day, particularly among the Amish, uh, there's quite a bit of tobacco grown. Here's another store and a mill that Stewart's men raid as they leave Jefferson. And again, you can see uh, what they're taking. Now notice here, bottles of wine and kegs of whiskey. You've got Confederate cavalrymen that have been riding now since June 22nd. So they've been going up and down over mountains. They've been going through some of the most hilly undulating terrain in Maryland and now south, south central Pennsylvania, and they find alcohol. Not a good combination because we're gonna hear a lot of reports, uh, particularly among the farmers of York County, uh, talk about drunken Confederate cavalrymen uh, almost half asleep in their saddle as they're riding through uh, Southern York County. Here's Stewart's route. You see the Battle of Hanover uh, in the bottom left. He's now pulled south and east to Jefferson, and he's now starting to ride north to York, uh, to New Salem. Remember, he's got two goals in mind. Number one, York, where Jill Early supposedly is, and as a fallback position, Dillsburg in northwestern York County. Uh, and again, we under know that you know, uh, Kilpatrick is still uh, fighting in Hampton uh, until dark. This is Stewart's route. Uh, this terrain map's hard to see on the computer, but trust me, this is up, down, up, down, up, down. Uh, I every now and then lead uh, tours for the York County History Center of Stewart's ride through York County, and the people could come away amazed uh, that anybody would ride a horse up and down this terrain. Uh, it's basically a washboard, uh, constantly up, down, up, down, up, down. They've been fighting a battle. So again, these horses are tired. Some of them were wounded. Uh, some of them are exhausted. Uh, and Stewart's men have a goal, of course, of starting to take horse flesh. They need fresh horses as they continue this route. But as they start going through the southwestern York County, uh, Stewart's men start encountering a very strange oddity. They see Pennsylvanians that are making strange hand gestures. They're touching their noses. They're going up above their heads, they're clapping, they're going back to their noses. And they're also presenting to Stuart's men golden pieces of paper. And most of these people are Germans or second or third generation German Americans, as we now call them Pennsylvania Deutsch or Pennsylvania Dutch. Uh, 
these folks don't speak much English. Uh, and Stuart's men are amazed that the Germans are speaking one word, well, two words, repeated. They're saying, peace, peace. Now, Stuart can't figure out what's going on. Neither can Fitzhugh Lee, neither can a lot of his men, several of whom wrote letters about this incident after the war that I have in my collection. They see the Pennsylvanians making these strange hand gestures and they're, you know, waving these golden tickets in the air. They can't figure out what's going on, but they do notice that every single farmer that's doing this, all the horses and cows are still in the fields. Um, everything's still there. The smoke houses are still filled. The chicken coops are still filled. Nothing's been removed from the farms. Now, this is a heavily copperhead pro-Democrat region of Pennsylvania. Manheim Township voted 174 votes for John C. Breckinridge in 1860 and two votes for Abraham Lincoln. This, no, very few Republicans to be found in Southern York County in those days. And these are very much connected to Maryland then and now. Uh, this is Baltimore North in a lot of ways. So Southern York County, uh, these civilians are desperately trying to save their horses. Turns out con men from New York City had been coming through the region in the weeks before the Battle uh, of Hanover. And for $1, they have convinced the locals to shell out money to buy a membership card to the Knights of the Golden Circle, a pro-Confederate sympathy group that did not exist in York County, Pennsylvania. Didn't exist here. But the con men convinced people to pay their dollars. They got the membership card. They learned the secret signs. They got the password, peace, peace. And they learned that uh, you know, we're gonna be fine if, when the Confederates arrive. The con men took the last train out of York back to Philadelphia and on to New York City. And in August openly bragged about their exploits in an issue of the New York Tribune. Uh, and several York County civilians also left met diary entries about this. But the rebels are thrilled. Once they figured out that all these farms are where they can collect the horses from, uh, they're looking forward to finding civilians who are crying out, peace, peace, and are waving these tickets out along the roadway. It's almost like, come rob me. And so these poor copperhead farmers are finding out brutally uh, that the con men from New York City were certainly not to be trusted. Here's just an example, just in and around Cadoris Township alone. Again, notice the names are almost all German. Uh, and from the 853 damage claims from York County, you can start extracting what Stewart's men were taking. More importantly, a lot of these guys talk about the time frame. They say, you know, Stewart's cavalrymen came into my field at 4 p.m. and took my horses. And by matching up their damage claims to 1860 uh, property maps of York County, I can pinpoint exactly where Jeb Stewart was at what time with which brigades on which roads as he's going through South Central Pennsylvania. It's an absolute gold mine. Uh, sorry, these people never got their money, but as a writer, uh, this is absolutely phenomenal since it's sworn testimony. Uh, oh, by the way, if I go back here again, look at Jacob Robert. Two more barrels of whiskey have fallen to Fitzhugh Lee's men. Well, Stewart uh, calls an evening council, either at the house on the left of the screen, this is the John Ziegler farm, or at the intersection that you see on the right of the screen where Ziegler's father owned a tavern that was there in 1863 at either John E. Ziegler's uh, farm or John B. Ziegler's tavern. At one of those two locations, Jeb Stewart calls a council of war. He summons Fitzhugh Lee, summons uh, uh, couriers to bring up representatives from Chambliss and representatives from Hampton's brigade that's still well, well behind him. Uh, and they learn that Jim Worley's left York. Early's not there anymore. In fact, Early's been uh, reported as leaving on the Shippensburg Road, heading towards Shippensburg. So Stewart decides that his next best option is if, if Drew Borley's gone from York, I need to go to Dillsburg. That's the rally point, uh, heading to Dillsburg. Well, 
throughout York County, of course, there are all kinds of civilians that are being terrorized in their minds, at least by the outriders uh, from Stewart's column, uh, Fitz Hugh Lee's men. Uh, the very first Confederate vanguard, in fact, arrives at Ziegler's Lutheran Church just as the funeral of a Union soldier who died in the Suffolk campaign is being, can uh, he's being interred as Stewart's men arrive. Believe it or not, they take all the horses and all the wagons and all the carriages for the mourners uh, because the Confederates need the horses far more than the mourners do, and they're going to send the mourners walking home. Uh, that grave site's still there. I show people the grave of the Union soldier uh, when I do my tours of York County sites. Uh, on the left is the Rosanna uh, and uh, Henry Hoff farm. Uh, Mrs. Hoff uh, talks about the fact that three drunken Confederates come to her house. They take her family's horses. They go into a uh, series of woods that are nearby and get, to, frankly, to use a modern word, they get blitzed. Well, she puts on a white robe, her white bonnet, uh, walks out in the middle of the night, and apparently, probably scares the Confederates to death thinking there's a ghost, but she gets her horses back and she gets the Confederate horses as well. Uh, so she ends up netting uh, three horses for her trouble, as well as recovering her own horses. Pay attention to this map that I'm showing you now. These again are the damage claims. This is North Cadoras Township. Stewart's continuing to march north. The reason I show this is that you're going to see how desperate Stewart's going to become as this ride continues. Notice that every farm that's marked in red is a damage claim. And almost every single one of them is within a five minute ride of the main highway that Stewart's on. Stewart's keeping very tight rein on his columns. Uh, the men are still in formation. Uh, everything's going still reasonably well at this point in time and Stewart is able to collect horses. Now we know in York County that about half the people that suffered losses to the Confederates never bothered filing damage claims. So you can pretty well imagine that every farm that's not listed uh, with a red box uh, within that five minute ride off the main path, Stewart probably took something from them as well. Again, those names, heavily German region. Uh, the Germans of York County were almost all Democrats. As we get farther north, the Quakers, the English, the Scots-Irish and the Welsh are almost entirely Republican. So the farther north, Stewart rides, the farther away from the Mason-Dixon line he gets, and the farther away he gets from the Copperhead region. Uh, by 8 p.m., Fitzhugh Lee has reached uh, New Salem. Uh, small, again, little crossroads village. Again, the first Confederate damage claims uh, are filed from the farmers in this region right around 8 p.m. So we now know, again, Lee's in the lead. So Shambliss is behind him. Uh, and Wade Hampton, of course, is still at Hanover. Uh, now, a local by the name of Henry Gable, who owns one of the hotels on the square, uh, tells uh, Jeb Stewart that Jubal Early is definitely in Dover. That's where I last heard. Uh, I don't know if he's still there, but that's the last place uh, Early was reported to be. So Stewart leaves instructions, we're not going to York. He's gonna leave one of the staff officers, John Eston Cook behind. Uh, if you see the white building on the right of the photograph, that's the building we believe where John Eston Cook will sit on the porch. It's now an antique shop. Uh, back in 1863, this was a Francis Gipes Hotel. John Eston Cook's job is to wait for Shambliss to arrive and to tell Shambliss, you're not going to York, we're all going to Dover for the night. And likely as soon as he tells Shambliss that, Cook stays behind again, still all alone uh, and waits for Wade Hampton, uh, who's not gonna arrive here till well after 10.30 at night. John Eston Cook will write that he's drowsy, he's sleepy, he's tired, he hasn't eaten. Uh, and he sees the Pennsylvanians surrounding him with, uh, in his mind, weapons. Uh, and he dares not fall asleep because he thinks he's going to be murdered by the citizens of Pennsylvania. Now, he's not going to be obviously murdered. One Louisiana tiger, by the way, is murdered uh, as Jim Early's columns coming into York County by one of the civilians.
but nobody in Stuart's column is going to be molested by the civilians. They're all terrified uh, as this Confederate horse column is riding through. Uh, so Stuart continues to march north. Uh, it's now dark. Uh, and again, uh, you can see his route. He, find, he crosses Route 30. He's not going to York. He's following what's today Route 1, uh, Route 616, uh, heading towards Dover, Pennsylvania. He's going to cross four, four separate east-west routes that Joe Borley's division has taken. The problem for Jeb Stewart, it's nighttime. He can see no evidence of an east-west movement at any of these intersections that he crosses. If it had been daylight, if he had not been delayed by the Battle of Hanover, perhaps he runs into Joe Borley. Perhaps he sees that Early has turned west and headed towards New Oxford and Heidlersburg. Perhaps Jeb Stewart also follows him and goes west. But it's nighttime. And Stewart never turns west. Four separate routes that Early's men on parallel roads are on. And Stewart intersects all four roads coming perpendicular from the south and misses them all. He never once turns to the west. And more importantly, he never once sends out scouting patrols, at least at this stage. Uh, there's no evidence that Stewart sends out a single outrider looking for Joe Borley. Now, at the same token, my good friend Eric Wittenberg and J.D. Petruzzi wrote a book a few years ago called Plenty of Blame to Go Around. Uh, and I helped with some of the editing of the York County chapter in that book. And I can tell you that, you know, I fault Joe Borley every bit as much as I do Jeb Stewart because Early has cavalry with him. He's got the 35th Battalion Virginia Cavalry. He's got the Colonel William French's 17th Virginia Cavalry. Uh, he's got almost 500 cavalrymen. Not one does Joe Borley ever send out searching for Jeb Stewart. Uh, so both Stewart and Early apparently are oblivious to the fact they're supposed to be meeting each other and looking for each other and it never happens at least on June 30th. Uh, there are all kinds of houses and farms that are still along the Stewart's route. This is pristine countryside. Uh, probably 80% of the homes that Stewart's men visit are still there uh, in the barns. Uh, this is just typical. This is Charles Spangler's wonderful country house, been greatly restored. Uh, from his barn, Fitzhugh Lee's men are gonna take, uh, as you see there, uh, five horses from his barn alone. Keep in mind, for each of these Pennsylvania farmers with summer harvest coming in just three weeks, uh, this is devastating to lose these horses. I mean, they're $150 to $250 a piece uh, in an era where most of the farmers aren't raking in more than five or $600 net profit. Now, Wade Hampton uh, is very, very tired. He's in the rear. John Eston Cook is now with him, the ordnance officer uh, of Stewart's brigade or division that Stewart has left behind. Uh, he's the guy that thought he was going to get killed by the Pennsylvania civilians while he waited at that hotel for Wade Hampton. Um, and John Eston Cook will later write, I was half asleep in the saddle. It was a veritable drowsy land that we moved through on horseback. The Dutchman, the Frows, the spreading, that's apple butter, the sauerkraut, the conestogas, the red barns, the guttural voices, the strange faces. These Virginians and North Carolinians, Georgians and South Carolinians, the Stewart's column, almost to a man, very few of them have ever been to Pennsylvania before. Um, a few of them have ever been in the middle of Ger German backwoods country. Uh, that's where they are. Uh, and John Aston Cook so eloquently writes about, uh, you know, in effect, as he writes later, uh, they're all asleep. Some of the men are, are drunk, uh, particularly in Fitzhugh Lee's column ahead of them. Uh, but these men are whipped at this barn, uh, which still exists. This is where we believe Wade Hampton halts his entire brigade. Uh, and he and John Aston Cook and several of the officers are going to take a cat nap. Uh, this is probably between midnight and one o'clock in the morning, uh, probably closer to one o'clock in the morning by the time Wade Hampton gets to this particular farm, which still exists along U.S. Route 30 at the intersection of Trinity Road uh, and 30, uh, just in back of today where a gas station sits. 
Uh, and again, Stuart's men are continuing to take horses. But again, what we're starting to see now is the desperation for fresh horses is starting to come in. Stuart's men are moving farther and farther away from the main routes. They're starting to break up as regiments and as brigades. And now individual groups of soldiers are going out looking for horses. And they're going a long way. We know of at least 100 of Jeb Stewart's men that will either desert or straggle or be horseless in York County, uh, because on July 4th, uh, the first troop Philadelphia City Cavalry will record 102 uh, captives that they seized in York County that are from Stewart's column. So whether these men are sleeping it off, whether their horses are played out and they're walking, whether they're tired of the campaign, uh, whether they're sick, they're ill, uh, whatever reason, 101 of Stewart's men are taken prisoner. We also know of dozens more that escaped through York County and will eventually make their way back to the South. Uh, so Stewart's column starting to fracture uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, and now at this point in time, it's 17 miles from Fitzhugh Lee as he rolls into Dover, Pennsylvania to the rear of Wade Hampton's column. 17 miles of Confederates strung out on this washboard terrain on June 30th as night now approaches. Uh, but look again, see how there's the Confederates are starting to scatter out and go farther and farther and farther away from the main roads. Uh, as you start to see inside this narrow pattern, I just saw an excerpt from this map. This is Dover Township. Uh, every single corner of this township is has damage claims from either the night of June 30th or the morning of July 1st uh, as Stewart's men. And again, we know the roads that they're on. We know the time frame. Um, Stewart will actually write that the night's march over a very dark road was one of peculiar hardship owing to the loss of rest for both man and horse. 17 miles, the men are exhausted, they haven't slept. It's the middle of the night, they fought a battle. Uh, Stuart continues, whole regiments slept in the saddle. They're faithful animals keeping the road unguided. In some instances, they fell from their horses, overcome with physical fatigue and sleepiness. It's not going to be until two o'clock in the morning till the very first Confederates arrive at Dover. The last Confederates will arrive at 10 o'clock in the morning. It will take eight hours, eight hours for Stuart's men to finally reunite at Dover, Pennsylvania. Now this is Dover. Uh, two of my kids and all six of my grandkids live in Dover. In fact, they live on Stuart's campsites. Uh, and no, they've never found anything when they were digging the foundation for their houses, unfortunately. But this is what Dover would have looked like. This is where Stuart's going to finally pull together his incredibly scattered uh, troops. If you look off to, uh, you see the White House uh, that's in the left center of the screen. If you go back to the, uh, just about northwest of that will be uh, the campsite of uh, Wade Hampton's brigade uh, to the right of the screen uh, just in behind this house uh, will be the beginning of the campsite of Fitzhugh Lee. Uh, this is what Dover would have looked like. This again is Pennsylvania Route 74, now known as the Colorado Road. Uh, again, you can see Dover. Uh, here are the three campsites uh, for the brigades. David Gross's farm is where Wade Hampton is. Alfred Weaver's farm is where John Chambliss is and uh, the unnamed farm, which is where my kids live, is where uh, Fitzhugh Lee's brigade would uh, stay. And again, every house uh, with a red circle around it are going to lose food or horses, uh, but mostly food in this case to Stuart. Uh, Stuart's men are raiding the town for whatever they could take uh, throughout the night. Uh, now, Jeb Stewart himself is going to have breakfast in downtown Dover at uh, Henry Freeze Hotel. That hotel is no longer there, uh, but he pays George Dick in U.S. bills. Uh, that family, believe it or not, uh, I'm told, still has the United States currency uh, that Jeb Stewart gave their great, great, great grandfather in payment for his breakfast and John Aston Cook's breakfast and the rest of his staff's breakfast. Uh, 
Now, Stewart is going to take Fitzhugh Lee with him and leave. Now, they've had the most rest. Uh, Stewart's going to depart Dover in the exact same order that he left Hanover. The difference is he's switching the wagon train now, uh, and the wagon train's not going to be with Fitzhugh Lee. Uh, Stewart's going to head towards Dillsburg, uh, via, uh, head to Carlisle via Dillsburg. Uh, he does uh, parole hundreds. Remember, he has 400 prisoners of war with him. He's going to uh, parole almost 250 of those Union soldiers. They're going to walk from Dover, Pennsylvania down to York, where the citizens of York will eventually greet them and have a giant banquet for these uh, vanquished Union soldiers. Uh, now, 25% of all the households in Dover report damage claims. Uh, Dover Township, again, that's probably half of the real tally. So we're now talking about half the township uh, that Stewart's men have hit. Uh, we know of 167 horses and two mules that Stewart's men will take between nine o'clock in the morning on July 1st and two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, this is going to be Stewart's route uh, from Dover. Uh, you can see his entire route uh, arriving at Dover, but he's going to take Fitzhugh Lee's men, and they're going to ride to Dillsburg, again, because he thinks that's where he's supposed to be. He also thinks that beyond at Carlisle, he's going to find Richard Yule, not realizing that Carlisle's now occupied by William Farrar Baldy Smith in New York and Pennsylvania State Militia. Uh, by now, as we all know, it's July 1st, so what, what's going on with Jubal Early? He's on his way to Gettysburg to arrive at two o'clock to fight on the battle. Uh, Richard Yule, uh, Robert Rhodes' division is also going to arrive at roughly the same time frame. As we all know, they're going to smash into the Union 11th Corps north of town. Uh, the 1st Corps is going to engage Heath's division, later Pender's divisions west of town. And while this is going on, where's Jeb? Jeb's in northwestern York County. Now, it's very interesting that I find only a few scattered references, and I've, and I've looked and I've got a lot of letters from York Countyans and diary entries, but there's only very, very few accounts in northwestern York County of anybody hearing the Battle of Gettysburg. I've got dozens and dozens of accounts in western and southern and eastern York County, as far east as Lancaster, Pennsylvania, they can loudly hear the Battle of Gettysburg. Here's what's important. Jeb Stewart can't hear the battle. Fitzhugh Lee can't hear the battle. There's apparently some sort of acoustic shadow passed by South Mountain, and in northwestern York County, you cannot hear the sound of the Battle of Gettysburg. And what's interesting is on a really good good, clear summer day. In southwestern York County, you can hear the reenactments of the Battle of Gettysburg if the weather's just right. Northwestern York County, oh no, you can never hear the reenactments. Now that's not enough artillery, they're at half charge or quarter charge, but it gives you the idea that this acoustic shadow created by South Mountain is very real. It's there, and Jeb Stewart does not hear that there's a battle to the southwest. Well, what he does do is he figures out I'm in trouble and he starts sending out scouts finally. He sends out Captain or Major Henry B. McClellan, as well as other scouts looking for Jill Borley, Robert E. Lee, Richard Yule, anybody can find at this point in time. Scouts are now combing the countryside. Uh, but his men are in horrible shape. This is Richard uh, L.T. Beale, he's the uh, Colonel of the 9th Virginia. He writes, from our great exertion, constant mental excitement, want to sleep and food. The men were overcome and so tired and stupid as to be ignorant of what was the taking place around them. Stewart's men, even if they could hear the Battle of Gettysburg, they're so tired, they probably have, don't have the faculties to even really understand what's going on to them. Uh, but they're out looking. They're trying desperately to find out what's going on. Stuart and Fitzhugh Lee's men clatter across this bridge. This was the last covered bridge in York County. Uh, I believe it was when it was taken down. 
I can see the rickety remains of it in the 1960s from this postcard. Uh, but Stewart and Lee's men uh, are crossing Conewago Creek. Uh, they again are starting to take horses. Now, the reason I've got these people boxed here is there are six civilians along Fitzhugh Lee's Jeb Stewart's route that are very upset about their horses being taken. Uh, a couple of days later, uh, they find a black man who had accompanied Stewart's column, well, or maybe Albert Jenkins' column that was here earlier, but probably Stewart, uh, and they execute the man uh, for stealing horses. It's the only known uh, shooting of a Confederate slave uh, done, uh, as far as I can tell, anywhere north of the Mason-Dixon line. Uh, these six farmers are brought to trial in York for murdering the Confederate slave, uh, enslaved individual, and they're found innocent uh, and acquitted of all charges because the man's a horse thief, uh, at least in their opinions. Uh, there are a lot of letters the Confederates write as well about York County. I'm just going to talk about a couple of them here. Uh, this is Senator Lewis Wigfall, Confederate General's son. 18-year-old Halsey Wigfall is an artillery officer in Stewart's Horse Artillery. He writes, you should have seen the Dutch people in York County turning out with water and milk and bread and butter and apple butter for the ragged rebels. I was quite surprised at the tone of feeling in that part of the state. In two or three instances, I found people who seemed really glad to see us in the scores of houses they had refreshment at the door for the soldiers. People generally seem not to know exactly what to expect, and I don't think would have been at all astonished if every building had been set on fire by us as we reached it, nor would a great many have been surprised if we had concluded the business by massacring the women and children. And that's pretty typical. By the time Stewart gets to Republican country here in Northern York County, these people aren't friendly, uh, but they're terrified. They're scared to death. They're Republicans. Uh, they support Lincoln's war efforts. Uh, they are not copperheads. They don't have allegiance or even familial or uh, business relationships with Maryland. Uh, these people are connected to Harrisburg and Pittsburgh. Uh, and Stewart's men are running amok. And rumors are spreading wildfire that Stewart's men are going to start killing the women and children in this region. Uh, now, Stewart, to keep the men in the saddle, uh, calls up his Sweeney, his banjoist, and they start, and he and Fitzhugh Lee, and the men start singing as they ride through Wellsville, Pennsylvania. Uh, local citizens in Wellsville record the fact that the Confederates were singing, although not too joyfully, uh, as one person uh, talks about the fat fact. Uh, as they're riding through Wellsville, Stewart's desperately trying to, to improve morale, keep his men riding. Uh, they still have time to raid the local areas. This is a whip factory. This is the post-war expanded whip factory, but Stewart's men are going to take as much of the leather goods, uh, whips, harnesses, things they can use the military out of the factory. But now look how far off the beaten path they are. This is typical on July 1st, Warrington Township. Uh, Stewart's men are everywhere. I mean, they they're really have fragmented. All regimental uh, cohesion is gone at this point in time. Men are just riding wherever they can to find fresh horses. As mentioned, at least 100, uh, more than 100 of Stewart's men are going to be taken prisoner, mostly in northwestern York County, uh, by uh, First Troop Philadelphia City Cavalry on July 4th uh, through July 7th. Uh, again, most of the farms are still here uh, on my tours. I lead people there. Uh, Shambles' brigade's on a different road. Uh, Shambles is about two and a half hours behind Fitzhugh Lee. He is not going to Dillsburg on the same route that uh, Stewart and uh, Fitz Lee are taking. Shambles is on a different road. Uh, his men are pretty well tightly controlled, as you can see from the damage claims in Washington Township from Shambles' brigade. Uh, Stewart finally rolls into Dillsburg himself. Now, the Dillsburg marker says he's got 6,000 guys. No, he doesn't. Uh, 4,500 at best, maybe less than that. Uh, but he finally is in Dillsburg, but there's no Confederates. This is the rendezvous point. Jubal Early's not here. A.P. Hill's not here. Richard Yule's not here. There's nobody here but the locals. Uh, Stewart's men parade through town. Again, they're going to raid all the 
the stores they can find. Uh, here's just typically uh, damage claims for what Stewart's men, again, mostly fits your Lee's brigade are taking as Lee's men are going through there. Uh, you know, hit the post office. That's the picture you see with horse and, and buggy down below. Uh, and they're just gonna keep going. Uh, this is uh, what's today Dill's Tavern, a local landmark in the region. Stewart's men are of course going to go past it. Uh, John Aston Cook, our friend, the ordinance officer, uh, he and other uh, Fitzhugh Lee's officer, perhaps Stewart himself, I'm not sure, are gonna have dinner at the Howard House uh, owned by a guy who says the Philly Fox. Uh, philosophic uh, Mr. Miller. Uh, and he talks about that this tavern is covered with pictures of black trotters and skeletons conveyances making rapid time. It's the only description Cook ever gives inside a tavern in Pennsylvania. And it's rather interesting. Uh, one of these pictures from that very tavern, at least we think it's one of the pictures, uh, showed up at auction a few years ago. Meanwhile, back in Dover, uh, Wade Hampton has got his hands full because Fitz uh, Kilpatrick all this time has not been idle. Kilpatrick has sent a uh, patrol after Jeb Stewart to kind of shadow him to see where he's going. Uh, Wade Hampton will fight a battle just west of today's Dover High School at Strayer's Church. Uh, very small skirmish. He'll drive off the Union pursuers uh, two more times. Uh, Major Alexander's uh, patrol from Kilpatrick's division are going to encounter uh, Hampton's rear guard and have gunfire at various locations in Northwestern York County. Uh, Hampton finally pulls out of Dover at about 2 p.m. Hampton now has the wagon train. Uh, Fitzhugh Lee had it at first, then Shambliss had it, now Wade Hampton's got it. Uh, Hampton's gonna take a third route to Dillsburg uh, as again, Lee's column is totally fractured. Uh, Stewart's column is totally fractured. Uh, this is the route that Wade Hampton's brigade uh, is going. So when I give my tours of York County, I usually ask people, do they prefer to go with Jeb or do they want to go with Shambliss or do they want to go with Wade Hampton, uh, depending on what their ancestors may have been or what their particular interests are, because the route like a trident uh, separates. Uh, this is the site of the final skirmish between Kilpatrick's patrol under Major Alexander and uh, Wade Hampton's rear guard at Rossville, Pennsylvania. Happens right in front of where this uh, former hotel is. Uh, and again, these are the claims uh, for Wade Hampton's brigade. Uh, Hampton's men are also uh, starting to spread out throughout Carroll Township looking for horse flesh as they arrive at Dillsburg. This is one of the farms the Wade Hampton's men uh, come to. This is John Cook's farm. Uh, John Cook's relative, Jesse Cook, was a major Underground Railroad conductor in northwestern York County. The Cook family are Quakers, uh, abolitionists. Uh, well, Stewart's men, or Hampton's men show up on this farm and they try to steal the horses. And the 42-year-old lady, she looks about 82, but she's actually 42. Do. This is Lady Ann Cook. She's going to chase three of Hampton's men around the barnyard with her bread knife. Actually, it's a butcher knife. Uh, and these, she chases the three Confederates away. And she manages to save all the horses that are right in the barnyard. But unfortunately, the uh, family uh, that's hid the, the rest of the horses in the, the woods lose them all, uh, as Hampton's men proved to be very adept at horse finding. Wade Hampton is going to camp for the night just outside of Dillsburg on the John Mumper farm. This is John Mumper. Uh, he's an elderly farmer. He uh, invents his own uh, apple, the uh, Mumper Vanderveer apple strain, which is still widely grown in the region. But Wade Hampton's going to destroy the man's orchard, just destroy them. They're going to break down the, the they're hungry. <laughs> they don't have much to eat. Uh, so they're going to take, uh, break down the trees uh, and are passing the boughs around, uh, eating all the apples. They rip down all this man's firewood. Uh, this is the farm. This is Wade Hampton's recently discovered campsite. Uh, Wade Hampton actually, unfortunately, the farmer that lives here does not allow metal detecting or trespassing. Uh, but uh, this is where Hampton's men will spend the night uh, of July 1st, 1863. A courier will finally arrive uh, in the middle of the night from 
we, uh, Jeb Stewart. And we'll tell Wade Hampton here that you know, there's a battle raging at Gettysburg. Uh, you need to leave and go that well. Uh, skipping ahead, uh, Stewart is by this point in time has left Dillsburg. He's way ahead of Wade Hampton. He's at Carlisle. Uh, this is his route again, uh, Pennsylvania Route 74. There's almost no horses taken along this route. And Stewart by now has got his men uh, pulled together tightly. They understand there's Yankees ahead of them. They're preparing for battle. As Stewart gets to Carlisle uh, it, during the night of July 1st, he encounters Baldy Smith. Uh, he tries to get Baldy Smith to surrender. Baldy Smith tells him, heck no. And Stewart ends up shelling the town. Uh, some of the buildings in Carlisle, including the courthouse, still exhibit damage from the horse artillery shells that exploded in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. It's one of his last acts. Stewart's going to catch the Carlisle barracks on fire. This is where Richard Stoddard Yule and other Confederate officers had uh, trained for the U.S. Dragoons uh, before the Civil War. Now, middle of the night, July 1st, early morning, July 2nd, Stewart finally gets his three scattered brigades back on the road together. Now they know they're supposed to be at Gettysburg because Henry McClellan had found Robert E. Lee's army at Gettysburg and has ridden back to Stewart to tell him that you're needed in Gettysburg. There is a battle raging there. Uh, so by noon on July 2nd, the only people left of Stewart's column in York County are these stragglers and deserters, uh, people who are now no longer have horses. Uh, and again, look, they're, they're pretty crisp. They're not taking many horses now uh, as they head to Gettysburg. This is Wayne Hampton pulling out at the end. Uh, again, Hampton bringing up the rear of the column uh, is marching through Franklin Township passing through Clear Spring, Pennsylvania, uh, one of the last towns in York County uh, to have the Confederates. And again, you can again see they're still taking stuff though from the mills, mostly food. Uh, at the house uh, here on the right that unfortunately was just ripped down a couple of years ago, uh, the man that lived there, his name was George Dick. He says that many of Wayne Hampton's men uh, piled up uh, their worn out boots and shoes on the porch of the, his store, which was at this very building. He lived on the second floor and they took his entire stock of shoes and boots. Uh, and so, and they left a huge pile of worthless Confederate leather uh, on the porch. Unfortunately, he said this house was just taken down. Uh, Wayne Hampton is gonna march into Adams County uh, reaching York Springs, again, taking horses along the way. And that afternoon, as we all know, Wade Hampton runs into George Armstrong Custer at Hunterstown, Pennsylvania, on his way to try to find uh, Jeb Stewart, or try to find Robert E. Lee. Uh, and finally, finally, as we all know from the movie, Jeb Stewart finally arrives at Gettysburg very late on July 2nd. He's got 600 fresh horses, taken in York County. Uh, those horses are going to fight on July 3rd at the East Calvary Field battle. Uh, and when you study the tactics of East Calvary Field, never forget that particularly at Fitzhugh Lee's brigade, uh, most of the men are mounted on York County farm horses, carriage horses, plow horses, because they're finely tuned Virginia ponies war horses they rode into Pennsylvania are now either dead along the road or have been swapped out in Pennsylvania farm fields for uh, Percherons, Morgans, Conestogas, uh, and the other uh, horses. The net upshot in South Central Pennsylvania of Jubal Early's uh, June 28th, uh, June 26th through June 28th ride through York County and Jeb Stewart's ride on June 28th through July 2nd, his anti-Lincoln sentiment grows dramatically. Uh, this area will not vote Republican for the next 80 years as a result of uh, pre-Civil War Democratic proclivities and resent anger that will last for generations over Jeb Stewart's ride. Oh, by the way, John Mumper, the poor uh, horticulturalist that lost his entire uh, fortune, all of his trees, his orchard. He dies of a heart attack uh, within days after uh, Wade Hampton leaving. His property sold at auction on November 12, 1863, the last casualty of Jeb Stewart's ride through York County. So we back to the movie.
You are the eyes and ears of my army. Where have you been? Well, we now know exactly, MJ Hinion. We now know exactly where Jeb Stewart is. He's riding around still to this very day, lost in York County, Pennsylvania. On behalf of my publisher, thank you to the two roundtables from uh, Connecticut for hosting us tonight. Thank you very much uh, to each and every one of you that's been on the attendance. Uh, have a great evening. And now I'll turn it back over to Phil and Dave. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. This is Bob O'Brien. Uh, I'm going to ask you for your number. And uh, yep, we'll... uh, my number is 23. 23. Okay. 23 is William Grossberg. Okay, uh, William, you just won a book. Congratulations. He's got Flames Beyond Gettysburg. And we also have your human interest story. So can you give me a backup number? Uh, 64. 64. Wow. It's like, I kind of read my writing. Dennis Madison, I think that's how I wrote. So he's got the uh, human interest book. Uh, Bill Grossburn, I'll get a hold of you. Dennis, I'll get your, e your address by email and I'll get the book to you. Thanks, Scott. Oh, thank you very tell. much. Were there any questions that came in? Well, first, I'll just jump in and say uh, that was a wonderful presentation. It's so gosh darn interesting. I learned so much tonight. So very well done, Scott. I'm sure Thank everybody you. here uh, would pass on the same sentiments. That was excellent. And if anybody has any questions, you can either type it in in the chat or, or just raise. Carolyn. I have one. Scott, do you know how many um, horses uh, Stuart started with and how many he wound up losing? No, I mean, what we do know in York County is he took a little over 600 horses. I mean, I, I have a database online at the website of the York County History Center from okay. all 853 damage claims. Uh, there were 1,057 horses taken between Jubal Early, James Noonan, uh, that's a whole other Confederate column, and Jeb Stewart. So the three Confederate columns took over 1,000 horses, but Stewart took 600 of them. Uh, now, we don't know exactly how many horses Stewart left in York County or how many horses died along the route. Uh, were taken in by the farmers, uh, but we can pretty well guess that, you know, the numbers are probably pretty close. Thank you. Great program. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, Scott, I'm Jordan Gare. I'm the president of the Hoosier Tonic Similar Round Table over in Shelton. Yep. Uh, interesting note. I just finished reading a book called The Lincoln Conspiracy, and you mentioned the organization Knights of the Golden Circle. That organization was behind the conspiracy to assassinate Mr. Lincoln on his way into Washington. In 1860. Yeah, I've heard that before. Yeah, actually, I cover the Lincoln assassination attempt in Baltimore in a book I wrote called This Trying Hour, the Philadelphia, Wilmington and Baltimore Railroad uh, during the Civil War. So you know, it's got a, about 12 pages on the Lincoln assassination plot at Calvert Station in Baltimore. And since York yeah. County was at the heart of that plot, uh, that's an area of keen interest. I will stress the Knights of the Golden Circle did exist in a couple of Pennsylvania counties, uh, particularly Berks County uh, in a couple other places, did not exist in York, Adams, or Cumberland uh, counties at all. Uh, obviously the Knights of the Golden Circle were mostly Tennessee, you know, Kentucky, uh, Illinois, Indiana region, uh, but they certainly did have some uh, adherents, uh, at least in uh, the Reading, Pennsylvania area. Good, thank you. Uh, Scott? <laughs> yes, MJ, go find Jeff. <laughs> yes, Scott, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, Harry. Um, I, I, great, great presentation, very thank impressed. You. Um, I actually have ancestors both from Dillsburg and from Carlisle. Oh, good. And a lot of my family are from the area. Um, one of my ancestors was Annie Mumper. I don't know if you've okay. heard the name. Sure. She, she has to have been related to John in some way. I'm not she sure. She was, I believe. Actually, I think Annie was his daughter. I'm sorry? I think it was his daughter or granddaughter. Yeah. But the family legend about that is, briefly is that um, when Stewart stopped in Dillsburg, he knocked on Annie's door and he and his staff were fed by her. And she had a sick child at the time and she told him that 
that would create difficulties in, in feeding them. So Stuart called in his surgeon and had uh, the surgeon examine the sick child uh, after she had fed them and sent them on their way. So wanted to share that uh, little nugget with you. It's a family. I actually, I actually have her letter in the book. Oh, terrific. Well, yeah, so, so if you want to read the actual letter, the transcript of it, what happened, uh, pick up a copy of Confederate Calamity because uh, uh, and Annie Muffer's letter, actually, uh, the transcript of it still exists in the Northern New York County uh, uh, Preservation and Historical Society. Right. Um, the, the only other comment I have is that I have another ancestor who was in Carlisle at the time Stewart arrived. And uh, she was in bed when this shelling started. And a Confederate shell actually broke through the roof of the uh, bank building across the street from the courthouse where she was sleeping and uh, almost killed her. Uh, but fortunately for her, the shell did not explode. Yeah. And uh, it, it smashed a marble top table in the lobby of the bank, which is still in the possession of the Cumberland County Historical Society. So those yes, are my two family related stories. Just wanted to share them with you. And thank you again for a great presentation. I appreciate you sharing that. That's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many. I mean, the one benefit of living uh, now in Pennsylvania for the last 20 years is I've had a chance to, uh, you know, when I was writing my many books, talk to a lot of people. I, I've knocked on a lot of doors. I've taken a lot of photographs of people's barns and stuff. And I've heard all kinds of just phenomenal stories because surprisingly, a pretty fair amount of farms are still owned by the descendants of the people who lived there when Stewart's men came through. And so they still have uh, stories that have been passed down, you know, three generations, four generations, uh, and then finding, in many cases, they weren't aware that their ancestors had actually filed damage claims that I were able to give to them that corroborated their family stories. Uh, although usually uh, the three horses Stuart took turned into 30 horses in a lot of the stories. Uh, Scott, uh, we have a question yeah, from Phil. Dave. We have a question from Dave for you. Um, yes. Was dragging around the wagon train based on Jeb's discretion or part of the day's doctrine? Uh, no, that was Jeb's. Jeb certainly had discretion. In fact, if I have, I have many faults of Jeb Stewart, but my number one fault is he never should have dragged those wagons through York County. That totally, totally slowed his column down incredibly. Um, but he honestly, you know, I've got a friend of mine who's a psychologist, and he tells me that his analysis of Jeb Stewart, it's rather interesting, that he thinks Stewart wanted to give those wagons to Lee as sort of a, you know, here, a little boy pleasing, uh, you know, his dad type relationship uh, that, you know, here, General Lee, look what I brought to you. Uh, and uh, But obviously it in turn turned out to uh, dramatically retard his progress and really, really slow him down. Uh, and in fact, he probably would have fought the Battle of Hanover much differently if he did not have those wagon trains that he had to leave uh, considerable numbers of men behind who did not fight in the battle to make sure the wagon trains were fine. Scott, I actually have a question of my own. Um, you mentioned the book, uh, Plenty of Time, Plenty of Blame to Go Around, which I read years ago and that was a good book. So it's a little bit off topic here, but from what I understand, uh, maybe kind of a two part. Uh, Jeb Stewart supposedly when um, he rode north on the ride, he kind of took the cream of the crop of his cavalry with him and left a couple brigades with Robert E. Lee. Uh, might've been Grumble Jones might've been one of them. My memory might be bad on that. But so I guess the question is, uh, there's some argument there that there was cavalry left behind for Lee and so did Lee not use his, the cavalry that was there wisely that he did have at hand? And uh, just maybe your opinion on that. Yeah, uh, Robert E. Lee had four brigades. Uh, Beverly Robinson's brigade was new to the Army of Northern Virginia. They had been trans uh, transferred to Stuart from, uh, I think, North Carolina, if I recall correctly. So Beverly Robertson didn't have a lot of experience at all on, in operating with Stuart or with Lee. Grumble Jones flat out didn't like Stuart. Uh, as you can tell from his name, he was <laughs> somewhat of a troublesome guy, but, but, but Grumble Jones was an outstanding outpost 
uh, in Pickett, uh, a guy, he was really, really good uh, at guarding mountain ranges, things like that, but he wasn't terribly good at finding Yankees. Uh, Lee also had John McCoslin, uh, the McCoslin's men, and John M. Bowden, who was the 4th Brigade, they were more adept at horse stealing uh, during the campaign, at least up to this point. As we all know, uh, M. Bowden does a brilliant job of getting the wagon train wounded out of Gettysburg after the battle. And John McCoslin, of course, comes back in uh, 1864 and uh, uh, will eventually be here uh, with uh, uh, taking over for Albert Gallup Jenkins. Uh, Jenkins actually commanded that brigade of cavalry that uh, uh, Richard Yule had. So bottom line is, yes, Stewart had the best. I mean, he took, he took Fitzhugh Lee. He had John Chambliss, which was Rooney Lee. He had Wade Hampton. They are by far, and I mean by far, uh, the three best of the seven brigade commanders of cavalry. Uh, we have a question from Andrea. Uh, how many horse, um, I'm sorry, how many of Stewart's horses were killed at the Battle of East uh, Cavalry Field? I have no clue. Uh, that's a great question. I'm not sure I've ever even seen an accounting of that. I mean, all we know is obviously he's got Virginia ponies and he's got these 600 horses that captured here, some of which turned out to be artillery horses or were used for pulling the wagons. So not all 600 horses from York County ended up uh, you know, under a cavalryman on East Cavalry Field. Uh, so I, I don't honestly know. I'd have to look that up to see if anybody's ever actually researched how many horses he lost uh, at East Cavalry Field. Uh, but they certainly weren't in tip-top shape by any stretch of the imagination. Um, we have a question from uh, Brian. Um, are your tours open to the public? Uh, no, I give, well... <laughs> My walking tours of Wrightsville and York in a non-COVID year, yes, are pretty heavily advertised. They're open to the public. Uh, my Stewart tour is usually done privately uh, via car caravan uh, because some of these roads, you don't want to put a bus through. Uh, there are bus routes that I can take people and I've actually trained a couple, uh, Chris Army and uh, uh, a couple other Gettysburg guides will give Stewart's ride uh, now. Uh, I've given the tour to them and they'll give it as well. Uh, so, you know, if you can't get a hold of me, call Chris Army, who's a Gettysburg licensed battlefield guide, who will give you the same tour that I've trained him to, and taught him how to do. Uh, although he knew most of this himself anyway. Uh, but certainly uh, by all means, send me an email at scottmingus.yahoo.com. Uh, and I could schedule tours uh, now that I'm retired, just about any time that people might be interested. Um, uh, there is a question from Ron Ciasulo. He says, thanks so much for a great presentation. How late do you have Stuart arriving in Gettysburg? I have heard and read stories of Stuart witnessing some of the fighting at Brinkerhoff Ridge late afternoon, July 2nd, giving in familiarity with the landscape of July 30s Cavalry Field. Uh, yeah, I've heard those same stories. Uh, I know I've talked several times to Eric Wittenberg and to other folks who are experts in the cavalry, including some of the licensed battlefield guides. Uh, I think most people would agree Stuart's there somewhere between 4 and 4.30, maybe 5, uh, that he physically arrives somewhere in the scene. So it's still daylight. Yeah, so yeah, it's entirely conceivable. He could have seen some of the action of Brinkerhoff's Ridge. Although, again, that's somewhat controversial as to whether he actually did or not. Um, I know Carolyn had posted some information on um, somewhere about from Chuck Teague that uh, Stewart lost almost maybe 2,000 horses in the whole campaign. I'm not, not sure. Uh, Again, that would make sense because, again, he's lost horse flesh all the way through Maryland. He lost some horses fighting at Westminster. Then he loses far more in York County. Then certainly he's going to lose horses at Hunterstown and again at uh, East Calvary Field. So that probably would, that would be a, a really good estimate. It wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, Craig 
posted a question. Um, did Stewart's wagons do good service on the retreat from Gettysburg or were they a liability? Uh, well, Stewart's wagons were incorporated into Robert E. Lee's entire wagon train. Uh, they were like, we don't know the exact wagons that Imboden uh, pulled out with the wounded, but it wouldn't surprise me a bit. In fact, it's probable that the 125 wagons that Stewart brought with him were probably part of the long column of wagons used to bring the wounded out of Gettysburg. But Stewart himself, obviously during the retreat, no longer has to worry about the wagons. And as we all know, Stewart does a pretty good job during the retreat. I mean, his men are pretty active in Funkstown, a number of other places. Do we have other questions? And you can raise a hand if you didn't put it in chat. Doesn't matter. Anybody can uh, would like to speak up while you have the chance. Well, while we're waiting for any other questions, just one quick comment. Uh, the book is called Confederate Calamity, Jeb Stewart's Ca uh, Cavalry Ride Through York County, Pennsylvania. It's available from Jim Schmick at Civil War and more. Just give him a call or visit his website, or you can go on Amazon and uh, pick up the book. Uh, it's based on entirely on the damage claims and on uh, Stewart and his officers reports and the letters and diary entries of York Countyans. Well, there's a lot of stuff in there that you know has not ever made it into any other book on Stewart's ride. So uh, it'll give you a, a, almost a blow by blow account with lots of photographs of the farms and the routes oh, that Stewart good. took. Um, Robert Carlson, I believe had a question. Robert, did you have your hand up? Yeah, when yeah. Stewart's troopers took these local horses, did they leave their Virginia horses there or did, did you take them riderless to kind of give them a relative rest, but they still uh, have horses with them. Yeah, Robert, he did both. Uh, there are several of the damage claim. So talk about, uh, you know, in some cases, dozens or in some other cases, scores of horses being left in the farm fields in exchange for the Pennsylvania horses. In fact, uh, the York County Fairgrounds, uh, a few days after Stewart's ride, a number of the Confederate horses were brought into York and uh, you know, farmers could, who lost horses could come try to grab one of Stewart's horses as a replacement if they wanted to. Uh, there are other cases where they led the horses out of the barnyards uh, or rode them and led their own horses. Uh, the damage claims are, are quite revealing and they talk about all three modes, uh, riding the horses, leading the horses or leaving their own horse behind. So all three happened quite frequently. Thanks. Good question, thanks Robert. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, oh yeah. Um, Jim Houghton has a question, Phil. Oh, okay. Is he unmuted? Yes. Go ahead, James. Okay. Um, I, I, it's hard for me to believe the what the combat capability was of Swiss cavalry on that third day. I mean, it, it had to be significantly degraded, wasn't it? I mean, they make like a big, a big deal, but gosh, they, the horses were shot, the men were shot. It's just, it's just incredible, I think. Yeah, it's entirely right. I mean, the very fact that Fitzhugh Lake could even do a mounted charge as tired as his men were, with several of them riding on uh, horses they weren't familiar with, and he still pulls off the, you know, that mounted charge that he hits Custer. Uh, that's pretty amazing when you stop and think of the background. These guys have been on the road since June 22nd, and now it's July July 3rd, uh, and they're constantly. I mean, with with very very little rest. I mean, you know, they're getting a night here, a night there, but particularly on on June 30th, July 1st, uh, they're not they haven't slept at all. So July 2nd at Gettysburg is probably the first decent night's sleep that any of these guys have gotten in quite a while. There's a question from, I don't know his first name, uh, it's D. Mick. Mick, did you had a question? I thought I saw you raise your hand. Go ahead. Um, you have to unmute. From the Wirt biography, I understand that Stewart was driving a herd of 200 mules from the wagon train. Do we, do we know he still had them in Pennsylvania? Uh, yeah, there are actually accounts of, of, of spare mules coming along behind the wagon train. Now, whether there were 200, I don't know, but there are a few civilian accounts that do talk about uh, mules uh, with the wagon train, which makes sense because there were probably spares. Okay. Um, 
Well, those, some of those mules were the ones from the 25 wagons that were destroyed. They were burned. Yeah, Iraq felt, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, some of the wagons were not in the greatest shape or were damaged. Uh, and they, they burned uh, those and yeah, brought the mules in. Of course, they brought the uh, drivers uh, with them. Hey, Scott, I have, a, I have one last small one uh, for me. So I know, I don't know about a lot of people, but I know reading up what was an eye opener for me, you always think of the cavalry running hard and fast. But can you talk about the pace of cavalry and how they would move? Uh, that really wasn't always the case with these guys running hard and fast on their, on their pace with the horses. Yeah, I mean, Stuart's throughout much of this ride is doing 35, 40, sometimes 50 miles a day. Uh, you know, obviously it depends on terrain heavily impacted how far he got. Uh, as did the circumstances, depending on, uh, you know, uh, whether Yankees or anything in their presence. Uh, but, you know, typically, you know, they're moving at a, at a fairly slow, slow pace. Uh, keep in mind, you've got artillery, you've got supply wagons, you've got forges. I mean, you're really limited by those. Uh, the horses themselves could have went a lot faster. Uh, but even without the 125 captured Union wagons, Stewart's got a plenty of his own wagons to worry about as well. Plenty of them. Uh, Kenneth, did you have a question? Well, you know, I can add uh, two things. I used to just ride cavalry and just, and that was just 10 or 12 guys, just the dust alone in riding 35 miles a day. Those poor guys, it's just amazing what they did. And, and then, you know, it's not like falling asleep in a car. When you're on the saddle falling asleep, it's really not sleep. But anyway, my question, I, the, the, the claims, that was just wonderful maps. And are you aware, like, I'd love to do the same in Maryland to see how far wide the claims are. But you, you Scott, you said those claims were, that those were Pennsylvanian, unique to Pennsylvania. Yeah, the, and these were... Now, I don't, Maryland may have had their own claim system, I don't know, but here in the Commonwealth, anybody from the, you know, basically the five counties from either uh, Jeb Stewart's raid in October 1862, uh, the Gettysburg Campaign in 1863, or John McCausland's raid in 1864, where he burned Chambersburg, half the town to the ground, uh, those five counties that were involved in, well, technically six, if you include a small to, uh, portion of Fulton County, but those, those six counties, you could file damage claims. Uh, there are over a thousand claims in Cumberland County. There's Adams County has a, uh, all of their claims. Uh, Tim Smith's got them at the Adams County Historical uh, Society. Uh, so you can, you can physically look them up. Uh, the, other, the other five counties, the claims are in Harrisburg. Uh, Adams County is the only one that actually has uh, the microfish in their own possession. So I had to go up to Harrisburg and transcribe everything and bring it back to the York County History Center. Um, Cumberland County, Franklin County, Fulton County have never been done to my knowledge with anything similar. Uh, Adams County has a very complete list of all their claims and I have the complete list for York County. But Maryland, yeah, I don't know, I don't never really paid much attention to, to whether they, they had, I couldn't, since my focus was on uh, Stuart after, after he left Hanover, I never really looked for much on the ride up. Let me just pile on one other thing when you talk about how amazing Fitzlee's charge was, these horses weren't used to battle. So the first no. time you fire a gun off these horses, it must no, these have been are like horses. a circus. Yeah, there's carriage horses, the riding horses, they're civilian horses. Uh, one comment, Ken, Kenneth, that you made earlier that I just want to circle back to for a brief second. Uh, there are accounts here in York County, the dust cloud kicked up by the three columns could be seen for miles. Uh, and you had three parallel dust clouds in the sky uh, at some points uh, from the three columns that were marching. It's also why uh, the civilians started racing for the hills with all their horses and the Confederates in some ways were forced to go far and wide to try to find them, find the horses at least. Okay, do we have more questions? 
All right. Well, um, one there, okay. Phil, from a Lowell Spencer. Oh, oh sure, Bob. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, Scotty asked, with Stewart surrendering the Southern horses, which were considered faster, more slender than the Pennsylvania workhorse breeds, did that end up being a liability to Stewart's cavalry after Gettysburg? Uh, obviously, by the time they got back to Pennsylvania or back to Virginia, they were replacing these horses as much as they could with their own. Uh, I don't really know how much of a liability it was after Gettysburg, because again, Stewart's men performed pretty well during the retreat. Uh, so either the horses were starting to get used to combat or enough guys have been shot and horses have been shot that they were able to swap out. I mean, really hasn't been much of a study done on Stewart's horses on the actual ride uh, retreat route. Uh, that's something I might want to ask Eric or Ken Masterson Brown or one of the guys that's really into the retreat, what they know about the actual status of the horses on uh, as they went back into Virginia. Okay. Um, so again, if anybody is if anybody's interested, uh, it's the York County History Center. Uh, so y yCHC.org. Uh, if you go on their military records, you'll see uh, my database of damage claims. And you can go in there and you know just start typing away for you know Stuart or Early or anyone else and all the damage claims, what people took uh, in an Excel spreadsheet will come up. Kind of fascinating just leaf through all the stuff people took. Well, I gotta say again, uh, anybody heard this talk tonight, I think blown away. It was just a wonderful job, Scott. Can't thank Excellent. you enough for joining us tonight. Really can't. Thank, thank you. you.